what's going on, fellas? We have made it to 7,000 subscribers. It only took me like 700 videos, but we're, we're chugging along slow and steady, baby. Uh, I'm fucking stoked. Thank you guys for the support on the videos. Thank you guys for always commenting. Uh, thank you guys for liking the videos. I appreciate you a ton. So we're going to do a little... Uh, Quick little Q&A as our celebration. Not the funnest celebration ever, but I saw that GVS does them. I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's like a nice little tradition for each milestone is that's when we do the Q&As. Maybe I'll make it every 500, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make it every 1,000, but I do think Q&As offer value. Even if they don't get the most views, I've learned a ton from just different lifters I respect doing occasional Q&As, and hopefully somebody gets a good question in there. So uh, it's definitely kind of like, one of my ways of giving back, because I've learned so much from these. I feel like I've got a reasonable base of knowledge at this point. Um, so it'd be a shame not to make the same, like be a real waste to not make what I've gained so much knowledge from. So every so often we'll do one of these. Today is our 7,000 subscriber celebration one. All right, uh, I got the questions pulled up here on my absolutely shattered phone. Uh, so we're gonna get after it. Uh, the first one, kind of a dreaded question, but it's the most liked one, I think. So I got to answer it. I got to do the ones I don't like if that's what you guys want to know. Um, oh, never mind. It's the second one I don't really like. My bad. First one is, you've mentioned your girlfriend doing performance-based bodybuilding. Could you go into a bit more detail about how something like that would work, how to pick movements, how would you prioritize it, and so on? Congrats on 7K. Well, thank you, man. Um, I'll leave Kirsten to go into like kind of the specifics of how she's doing it. But um, this idea of like performance metric centric bodybuilding or very logbook heavy bodybuilding is not something that's new. I know Paris has talked about it. It's not superior in any way to like a less performance oriented, more outcome oriented approach to bodybuilding that like basement bodybuilding talks about a lot. I just find that it meshes with the psychology of many athletes and it keeps them motivated and looking forward to train to have rep PRs. So it's like, how do we organize these things uh, where rep PRs translate to our real goal, which is hypertrophy, right? So we're going to select uh, exercises that have a big range of motion and are use the technique not that lets us move the most weight from A to B, but the variations of those exercises that we think are a little bit more hypertrophically minded. So we're not going to get massive arch wide grip bench. We're going to keep the arch very moderate, the grip width very moderate. We're probably going to be doing like a high bar squat, not a really hinge heavy low bar squat. We might be doing a stiff leg or an RDL rather than a conventional. We could do a conventional if we really wanted to place a bit of em extra emphasis on the erectors from a bodybuilding perspective, but we're going to select variations of these big compounds uh, that we think are like the better hypertrophy oriented, and that's what we're going to care about our performance on. And then also because our goal is hypertrophy, um, I don't really like getting into like a pure strength phase for people whose goal outcome is is um, is bodybuilding. I think you can get enough periodization and you can get enough of a strength-ish phase within the rep ranges that we think are actually relevant to hypertrophy, right? So we have this uh, whole like four, five, six, all the way out to 30 is all relatively useful. So we can periodize this performance-based bodybuilding training without ever really leaving uh, what we think is like productive from a hypertrophy perspective. And then some exercises is gonna vary, like I wouldn't really ever do a heavy six on a lat pull down. That kind of sounds shitty to me. Um, but the idea is we can create some periodization of, okay, we're squatting for 12s, we're squatting for 10s, 8s, 6s, right? So we're going to get a lot of the benefits that people propose of, oh, if you did a strength phase as a bodybuilder, you could do more weight for your hypertrophy phases. I think 6 is heavy enough to where we're going to be able to get those little bit of neural gains and we're going to be able to translate that to heavier 12s, but we also are never getting away from the actual objective. We never stop actually training bodybuilding. So we can have this like somewhat periodization within reasonable rep ranges. Maybe something like a pull down, we start all the way out at 20 and we get down to like 8 to 10, right? Because maybe lower than that, people really struggle to standardize their form on high RPE sets. So we keep those a little bit higher. But we have these ideal rep ranges where the bottom end is like what's either practical to the exercise or kind of the bottom end of what we think is like really a good use of time hypertrophically and the top end is what's practical for that exercise. We can periodize within that and we can always be chasing rep PRs on these variations. We don't want to be fudging our technique to chase the numbers. We want to stay within the parameters of good technique but that applies to any kind of training. That's not, a, that's not really a caveat of like oh, if you uh, do performance metric focused bodybuilding, you're going to fudge your form more and more and more. And that's the problem with it. And it's like doing something wrong. Is, like you can't, you want to engage with the people that are doing something well, not the people that are engaged doing it poorly. I'm going to leave Kirsty to talk more about the specifics, but that's kind of a general overview. I hope I worded that okay. That's a bit more of like a broader question that maybe I should have planned my answer for, but we, uh, we do it live. So the second question, my dreaded question, but it's been liked a bunch of times, so I gotta do it, is what are your thoughts uh, in a power building style of training uh, if you aren't a competitive athlete? 
Um, or do you stand more by hypertrophy phases and strength phases that feed into one another? Would love a general program from you someday. Your training in general looks very well thought out. Well, thank you. That's something I always, I can always like, I've got my theories on training. And so I look at like some people's training logs on Instagram. And I'm like, I see how they organize that. I really like it. Some people, I can't really piece together how they organize it, but I've got a lot of athletes that I like that I'm like, mm, I can see how it's organized. Maybe it's not how I organize it, but I like how that's organized. So happy to hear that. Um, I guess power, my thoughts on power building depend entirely on how we define power building. And that's kind of the problem with that whole shindig is if you give a really favorable answer, then yeah, it sounds super reasonable. If you give a really uh, it, like unfavorable definition of power building, yeah, it's stupid. You're getting the worst of both worlds. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with pursuing two different training outcomes at the same time. Yeah, they've got a good bit of overlap. Yeah, you might not be as good as if you were focused on pure bodybuilding or pure powerlifting, but it's totally fine to say like, well, I want to be strong and run marathon. Marathons. As long as you understand that you're not going to be as strong or as good at marathons as someone who's dedicated to and using the other one as only a means to an end, not an independent goal, that's awesome. Having mixed goals, we're not being paid to do this. I hope you have mixed goals, right? It's, it's very rare that someone, what they happen to really like, uh, like lines up perfectly with one moniker to call describe a style of training. If you like bodybuilding and you do some running, you do bodybuilding, but you also do some gymnastics. These are all cool. I don't understand really the problem there of like, okay, yeah, we are getting not the best of either world, but that can be okay. Again, it comes down to definitions. Like if you just describe power building as what I just described prior as like performance metric centric bodybuilding, then obviously I think I've got a decently favorable opinion of it. Um, I do think like basement bodybuilding is a very smart guy. I don't actually disagree with very much. We're just training for different outcomes and trying to find the smartest way to pursue those different outcomes. So it's like, I would love to disagree with him more, but he's actually a very reasonable, smart guy. And I think most of the things he brought up brings up are very common errors with taking like a logbook heavy approach. I think that sometimes that logbook heavy approach is really key for keeping people enjoying training because longevity and sticking with it is often the biggest limiting factor for how jacked someone gets long before any of the specifics. So factoring in enjoyment kind of matters. So that's a long winded way to say, ah, I don't really have any, if you're not, um, if you're not a competitive athlete, we don't have to adhere to trying to optimize our training more and more optimal being a buzzword that nobody likes right now and fair enough, but we don't have to move towards more and more optimal training because we don't have any specificity to dictate what optimal is. We can factor in uh, enjoyment a lot and we have some amalgam of what's effective, some amount of what we like and we strike a balance between the two. I can't really tell you my thoughts on power building because everybody I've asked gives me a different definition and some of them are good, some of them are really shitty and really bad understandings of how training works. Like, thinking you're going to get more jacked than someone doing effective bodybuilding training because you do heavy singles. Maybe I don't really agree with you there, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it if that's the way you enjoy to train. You can definitely optimize that program more and more for your own goals. Like, you know, not all bodybuilding approaches are created equal. Not all powerlifting approaches are created equal. And I guess within this paradigm of power building, uh, you can have a really shitty power building program or you can have one that's pretty decent that knows what it's, knows what it is that you're trying to do. All right, next one is, do you track calories? Uh, yes, I do, but like a lot of people that have been following like structured diets for a very long time, um, often I'll not know exactly where my calories are at because I eat the same thing every day. Everything is weighed on a scale. So I started with some XYZ macros. That obviously, I know what they are, but I started with those a couple months ago. And as I need to, I make adjustments in food qu quantities. And I don't necessarily math out like what this like small changes in the carbs is. Like the carbs were at 450. Where are they now? Right? Uh, I usually Usually will tailor as I need to bring my body weight up and down or as my recovery dictates I'll tailor up and down the quantities of the food so I can tell you the grams and the ounces of a lot of the things and those come up and down obviously I know a ballpark of my macros uh, but I don't actually calculate out where they're at any given time because I know they're not going to fall wildly shy of where they were because the food stays the same maybe I just added half an ounce of meat to each meal or I took away 50 grams of carbs from all of my rice meals or whatever it is so a lot of the manipulation after that initial like macro setting and build the diet around it. A lot of the manipulation just comes with food quantities, not actually paying too much attention to the macros a lot of the time. I know a lot of people that think about it either way, and I don't think there's, there's high performers that do both, and guys who I think are very intelligent and structure the diets well. Some of them prefer to think in food quantities, some prefer to think in zoomed out macros, whatever makes more sense to you. I think both can work very well as you become a more experienced dieter. The next one is build a recreational uh, home strongman gym. Got a squat rack, uh, stones, log, farmers, uh, and have one room for one machine, probably. What do you think I should choose? 
Oh, that's a good one. Um, like a lat, lat pull down low row tower would be one that really comes to mind. Obviously, Strongman being a very posterior chain heavy sport, uh, that does open some options and also following that same idea of it being a very posterior dominant sport, I could also really make an argument that a glute ham raise has enough utility to take up that one spot because you can do GHD sit-ups, you can do back extensions, you can do glute ham raises, uh, opens up a lot of training. It, it lets you do knee flexion, which you can't really do really, really effectively without uh, some kind of special equipment. You can do against bands, you can do Nordics, but again, these are a little bit hard to track and overload with time, whereas glute ham raise does open up that option. Um, so. I guess those would be the first two that come to mind. Hopefully I'm not missing something wildly obvious and stupid, but either a glute ham raise or a lat pull down low row combo. All right, this next one is uh, a bit long uh, and I'm probably gonna fumble something reading it because I am a legitimately really weak reader. I might, I'm hoping it's because I like wasn't diagnosed as dyslexic as a kid and I think that's what's going on. Either that or I'm, I'm actually just dumb as bricks. Probably maybe a little bit of both. So. I noticed you typically set a goal for a specific lift, attack it and get after it for a while, uh, and still keep everything else on the back burner. Once you're done, you then pick a new goal lift and get after it. At what level would you consider this approach to be superior to a more balanced approach, i.e. your typical uh, SBDP split, 531, juggernaut, bull mastiff, etc.? Uh, side question. I think I've heard you say uh, you try to balance giving us content we want while still trying to put out content you uh, want to do. What is something you've been putting off aside for a while? Um, so I don't like to describe my training that way because I like I just it's probably my fault for not showing all the other stuff I'm doing to try to keep my like press is not just on the back burner it's trying to increase uh, the whole putting things on a back burner or specializing is really something I've started doing only recently because the YouTube series are fun to do and speed running like a goal that would. I would normally pace out slower while chasing even development. It's been a fun little thing to do. I don't think that approach becomes super, like superior. Most of the year, when I'm not doing one of these fun, like, oh, I want to do this type of things, I'm focused on even progression. So I don't actually, I don't like this whole thing of like specializing things like hitting maintenance or sliding backwards. The vast majority of my training career, it's been kind of even foot on the gas for these different physical metrics of whatever I'm looking for. And I don't necessarily think that ever stops being the ideal. Obviously, when progress gets more sticky when you're advanced it's like yeah that is a tool you could do to leverage towards a goal and speed up what might be a very otherwise long process uh, but I don't think it's superior and I don't like training that way I like being the well-rounded guy but I just thought it's the road to 600 was just because I wanted to back off of benching for an extended period and focus on being a more proficient overhead athlete and I found that training my bench press simultaneously uh, was interfering with my overhead positioning so I wanted to be like oh, god I mean with it like I'm not with I didn't think I was within striking distance, but I was like, I want to get a 600 bench before I back off of it solely because I think I'm capable of it. Not because it was going to help my strongman, but because that would be a cool thing I can say for the rest of my life that I did. Uh, and I would kick myself if I didn't. So I'm like, okay, we're going to go in hard on this. And that way I can put that away for a while. And so it was more just to kind of convenience my overhead training rather than trying to do both simultaneously. If you're not a really big, strong guy, I wouldn't worry about this too much. It's more when you're like very developed through your pecs that the bench can really start to ruin your overhead positions. But for the first many, many years of training, if you would describe yourself at all as skinny, I don't worry too much about it. Uh, if you're trying to pick a bench press to support your overhead, definitely just do close grip. I don't think a wider grip and developing the pecs does too much to help you. But um, that was why I did the road to 600. And then the road to 880 deadlift is very, very different, right? By the end of the road to 600 bench press, I was very backed off of other things, which I don't like, but it was necessary to do it in the time frame that I did it. Uh, whereas this 880, I'm prepping for a show right now and I'm working hard on those events. So the other things are definitely not on the back burner. I do not want to show up, travel back to Washington, show up to my show uh, and be, be shit and stuff because, oh, I'm specializing in bench right now. No, I'm going hard on all the other events. I just happen to only be showing my deadlift, which is probably my fault. Uh, hope that answers your question. And then what video have you been like putting on the back burner? Well, I don't know how to do stuff where like I pull up my computer screen and I'm a little face in the corner because uh, I could do videos like that kind of breaking down different athletes techniques and how they structure their training. And I thought that kind of stuff would be interesting. I am just very, very uh, technologically illiterate in addition to uh, regular illiterate, I guess, <laughs> now that we uh, now that we mentioned that as well. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. I really, I'm not a creative guy, so I struggle to come up with the ideas for the videos. That's why I like repeating videos like The Road to 880. He's like, I make this every Friday. I do large lads whenever Max actually wakes the fuck up on time. By the way, his Instagram, uh, at the underscore one underscore rep underscore Max. Go harass him. You guys like large lads. I'm always game to make them. Don't take it up with me. Take it up with that guy. Um... But yeah, to answer your question, I don't really know. I don't necessarily know what's on my mind to make videos. Like, I'm definitely not very content creator brained by default. I usually am just thinking about lifting. I'm not really thinking about how that translates to videos and I gotta go get B-roll to make a good video and what's gonna get clicks in the thumbnail. Like, none of that stuff just does not occur to me a lot of the time. Uh, and so, I don't know. I don't really know. There's like stuff I think about. I'm like, mm, I don't know if that would make a good video or not. So there's probably some like more technical, dumb, minutia stuff uh, that I think about all the time that I'm like, ooh, I could ramble on a video, I'm not sure. Uh, so maybe that's the kind of thing I put off is like these more niche topics that a couple of people might find really interesting and a lot of people are gonna find very disinteresting. Um, but let's see, what is our next question? Because my phone screen is shattered, the uh, the face recognition doesn't work, so I have to wait for it to fail the face rec. I should just disable it. I, I realized that when I said it. But I will have to wait for it to fail face recognition twice and then put in my passcode, so you gotta give me a sec. You've already gifted the world with the Megalodon bench slash overhead program, wins the T-Rex squat and deadlift program coming. Um, I definitely will make more programs eventually. I don't really like it because, I, you know, it's like it's not lost on me that it's not going to be really locked in for anyone. It's a generalization of what's going to work for the broadest group of people. Um, and it, it kills me to know that, like, oh, there's some people who aren't going to find success with this. When it's like, really, I should be thinking about, like, not any, no one program is my method because I'm a coach. I'm not someone who does cookie cutter programs. It tailors to what the athlete responds to with time. So there's no one thing that's one my method. I could just put out some programs and people can try them if they want to. And I need to get to thinking about that, but I want my, if my name is going to be on it, it's going to get results for every single person that does it. So I just like, I put too much pressure on the creation of it and then I don't do it. So that is a hundred percent my fault. I'll get over that sooner or later. Maybe I'll put out some programs that I think are uh, fun. Um, is there any context you can think of where you would want to pre-fatigue an isolation exercise before a compound lift when training for strength? Obviously, when training for hypertrophy, that pre-fatigue pre can be a valid tool to change like what the limiting factor muscle is in a lift. So an example of this is uh, when I would, let's say I was doing dips, right? Because dips is a specific example of if I was bodybuilding, I might do this. If I do dips fresh, oftentimes my chest might be the limiting factor. My chest gets pump, pump, pump. Obviously I'm getting great, great tricep work, but the proximity to failure is largely dictated by my pecs. And uh, for something to be an effective hypertrophy exercise for a given motion, we would like that muscle itself, or for a given mo muscle, sorry, we would like that muscle itself to be the limiting factor. So the triceps were two, one, zero, RIR, if it's supposed to be a tricep exercise. Now compounds, this whole thing gets a little funky, but ideally we want the, the target muscle to be the limiting factor. But if I do tricep press downs before my dips, yes, my dip numbers go down, but the triceps are the limiting factor, so I can tally those pretty easily as a tricep exercise. Or uh, in my case, I have to dip a lot of weight because I'm very good at dips. I think I got up to like my body weight, which is like 260 plus like 270 and added weight for like five. I'm pretty good at them. So I don't want to do that many plates. So pre-fatigue can be a way to get good work out of less weight. So exercise ordering can be a, come into play there. But when it comes to strength, I know some people that like to pre-fatigue, if they've got a muscle that's really, really strong, um, and they tend to overutilize that muscle. So let's say maybe an athlete's doing push press and they got really strong shoulders. Um, sometimes what I, I know some guys that will like, oh yeah, I'm using too little legs and too much shoulders. I got too much subconscious uh, like confidence in my shoulder strength to where I end up underutilizing my legs. I know some guys that like pre-fatigue their shoulders so that like subconsciously they know their shoulders are fatigued so they have to do more work with their legs. So it could be a way to like reward certain technique or maybe... Uh, over or under use of certain muscles when we're moving towards whatever technical model we desire. Um, oh God, that was that's the only thing that comes to mind off the top of my head past maybe also load limitation in a strength training context when we get to the hypertrophy part of the workout. So like how I like to do my lower days, maybe I do some abs. 
I do my squats, maybe I do some RDLs, very normal workout for me, and then I kind of get into squat assistance work. Uh, and let's say maybe on the docket, I have leg presses and leg extensions. I might do the leg extensions before the leg presses so I don't have to put a bajillion plates on there to get a reasonable proximity to failure and get a nice hypertrophy response in my legs. So that's within the context of strength training, but I know that's probably not what you were thinking when you met compound. But if we're using compounds later in that workout for a more hypertrophy focused, rather than like a more high carryover focused approach, yeah, load limitation could come into play there as well. All right, the next one. Uh, how important do you find the skill of not running away with a concept one is given, i.e. being the volume guy or being like the really shitty if it fits your macros guy slash so many others versus committing to one's process wholeheartedly uh, and how do you balance the two within your own training and clients? So I, I think I get what you're getting at, right? Which is, hey, this thing is working. How do we not take that to its logical end? How do we not really buy into this thing that's working and take it and run away with it? Uh, and I think that's exactly what it is. We can commit to things that we've like, this has been working. I'm gonna keep doing it, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna keep ramping it up in magnitude. If frequency is working, that doesn't mean I'm gonna gradually move towards a squat every day program. It means two has been working, we're gonna keep doing it. And that's a very, very solid concept that I find myself leaning on for my own training and the training of my clients a lot. Is like, hey, if it's working and I don't see uh, something really bad coming, like in terms of like, okay, this is, this is gonna lead us into maybe an overuse injury or something like that. Uh, if I don't see like a end to it in sight that's obvious, and concerning, we're just going to keep doing it. We don't ramp up the magnitude. And then when it stops working, we can kind of ask some basic questions of checking in. It's like, hey, are you recovering really easily? Okay, well, maybe it's stalled out because we're not doing enough. But we're not going to start doing more and more and more until that certain amount stopped working. And then we can adjust from there. Or, hey, are you wildly under-recovered? Maybe it's too much now that you've gotten stronger. The absolute weights are higher. Maybe we need to dial it back. But really, I think I navigate that whole thing by, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Leave it alone. Um, even if you think something, oh, this might be better. Probably we just keep going. If it's working, just keep going. And that's what committing to your process wholeheartedly do is instead of doing more squats each week being your commitment, you do a better and better job with the six that you're doing right now. So the next one is at what strength level did you start to auto-regulate slash deload days to avoid injury in a, in a muscle group if a muscle group was feeling off? To be honest, I don't do that very much. Uh, this relates to something I think you're referring to what I said to Max on the podcast, which was something the lines of early in our training, we need to try to force our way through uh, because, you know, early on in our training careers, athletes tend to underestimate what they could do if they really put their mind to it. So if they go auto-regulate when they suspect they need to, they're going to auto-regulate a hell of a lot more often than they actually needed to. So you need to be a little bit bullheaded and try to push through these things to actually learn what a day that you actually need to auto-regulate feels like. Now, that being said, um, I am fortunate enough to have spent a very long time to put myself in a position where I live in a box, right? My variables are wildly consistent. I go to bed at the same time every night. I eat the same six meals, five to six meals every day. I drink the exact same amount of water to the milliliter every day. Um, I live a very, very, very boring life that I think a lot of people would really not like, but it means that I'm not like, oh, I'm surprise week today. It doesn't really happen. Every, like maybe once every couple of months, I get a surprise weekday. Now there's days that I come in and I'm fatigued and that's by design, but the program accounts for that and what it's asking me to do. Um, so I don't auto-regulate very often at all, but that's not because I'm some rah-rah cool guy. It's because I'm a dummy that lives in a box. Uh, you probably don't live in a box and you will need to start auto-regulating at some point. Now I don't know exactly what like, cause like, oh, it's when I hit XYZ lift. Well, well, you might be a really big guy. You might be a really small guy. So giving specific numbers numbers doesn't really help very much, but I do think early in the training career, that's why something like silly, like five, five by five, add five every session, no matter what, <laughs> if you stood up with the weight, add five, that does hold value in teaching people how far they can push themselves. Some of these more militant, like beat the books protocols, these things do hold value. And I couldn't really tell you exactly when you need to wean off of that and become a slightly more intelligent athlete, auto-regulate more, but that, that point will certainly come. All right, this has probably gotten a bit long, but uh, hey, we're celebrating, so uh, why not? Next one is, um, what has been your biggest setback and solutions to getting your strength up uh, in the big three, um, not just the big three actually, but any compound lift? Gosh, I've had a million setbacks, right? So early in my training career, 
um, my bench would be thrown off by tweaking my kind of rotator cuff. So adjustments to my technique, adjustments to my tensioning at the bottom, um, the inclusion of face pulls one to two times a week, the inclusion of a vertical press. Even if I don't expect it to carry over to my bench press, I found that, hey, yeah, the delts are like kind of the primary mover of the shoulder. When those are strong in the vertical plane, it might not carry over, but the frequency at which I would strain my rotator cuff uh, went very low. And then doing like pull, horizontal and vertical pulling where you really reach at the top and let the scaps rotate upward and really protract at the front of the rows. Uh, kind of implementing all those things, those rotator cuff strains went away. And then I would also tweak my pec every now and then. That really derailed my progress for a while and I moved to a closer grip bench press uh, and I warmed up a lot more thoroughly. I would always get a light pump to my pecs before working my way up on the bench. I always started at the empty bar. I would always bench 95, I'd always bench 135, uh, just because I realized that one of the biggest limiters in my ability to increase my bench was these frequent pec strains. Doing probably more volume than most people would think is a good idea to warm up for the bench press is something I started doing regularly. Taking my hydration really, really, really seriously, both the water and the electrolytes, not just the water intake. Uh, and then also, if it's remotely cold out, always warm up in a hoodie to make sure I was breaking a sweat to get physically warm. Uh, and all of these things kind of decrease the frequency at which I strained my pec. Um, I had a hard plateau in like the whole high 400s on my squat, um, which was because I was training... I was probably doing too many sets very, very close to failure instead of doing a greater number of sets a little bit further and drilling bad patterns repeatedly. I was getting some pretty shoddy form advice as well. There was just some basic programming errors I was making back then. I overcame that plateau by doing a lot of pause squats, heavy pause squats. I had a workout I was doing for quite a while there where I would have my head main squat day and that was whatever it was. And then I would do eight relatively difficult-ish triples on pause squats, um, in addition to just some regular bodybuilding work. And that helped me gain better control of my bottom position, helped me gain better control of my brace in the bottom position. And I finally got over that hurdle and made good progress into the mid fives. And then in the mid fives, I strained my adductor, which was because I was using a very, very excessively splayed out uh, toe position, which was just, I was like, I could do a lot of homework on the adductor machine and Copenhagen planks to make sure my adductors were prepared for that, or I could just put them in a slightly less stretched position by angling my toes slightly more forward. Uh, I definitely took that too far and angled my toes too far forward at one point, which was also a bit of a mistake on my part. The slight angle out I find very helpful for keeping my glutes strong. Um, I find when I found when I really crammed my toes like dead forward, almost slightly internally rotated, I was very strong. I would get this torque at my hip and my squat went up, 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 but my knees started taking a little bit of a beating and my glutes actually did kind of uh, get progressively weaker. And when I started turning my toes out, initially it felt so weak, but my glutes got stronger and my knees felt a lot healthier to have that slight outward toe splay. Uh, so I'd say the biggest setbacks on my squat were like, yeah, like so I was making some mistakes and then also I strained my adductor and then I also was having too much training ADHD and Fiddling with my squat program too much was kind of the bane of why my squat didn't progress quite as quickly as my deadlift and my bench press. It was just kind of too much fiddling around with it. Uh, biggest setback on the deadlift, eh, probably just not doing enough RDLs early in my career, really coming back to bite me, not having that nice pure hip hinge pattern established, not getting my hamstrings really, really strong in a stretched position via RDLs or stiff legs, made it so I got stronger really fast because I was aggressive and committing to hard pulls and I was I was going crazy. And, uh, you know, neurally, deadlift is a little bit more neural than maybe a bench press, which is a little bit more total muscle mass dependent. I was going nuts. So it's like the guys who are like, I hate myself, re... Uh, those guys tend to get good at deadlift really quickly because they don't need to have great technique. They don't need to gain a ton of muscle. They can just get some rapid CNS uh, adaptation, but then they usually hit a really, really hard plateau when they need to kind of rework their motor patterning to keep moving upward. And uh, that was me a little bit, to be honest. So those are some, some setbacks I guess I've had, just some stuff off the top of my head. It's probably too many to, I've been training for like 12, 11 years now. Uh, and uh, I hurt myself many times over those. Like, I can't remember how many times I've hurt myself and rehabbed and, okay, well, why did I hurt myself? Was it because I was underprepared in terms of my sleep or my hydration? Or, oh, is it something in my program where 
but his muscle was falling further and further behind until something inevitably went wrong. All right, we'll try to keep this one short. Um, favorite strength, non-strength, and combat sports athletes. Uh, this actually reminds me of something I was bitching about in the Discord the other day, which is dudes that are like, I have no heroes. I look up to no one. I am my own role model. Thinking it made some badass. And it's like, dude, you, you, you are mediocre at your hobby. This idea that you're above looking up to people is so weird to me. I've got a billion people I look up to a ton that I draw a lot of inspiration from because they're better at my hobby than me and they're better just as functional human beings. They're good at everything. They're a nice guy. They're a good dad. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you're like living life on like fucking turbo mode. Crazy. Very inspirational. I want to be like that guy. So I've got a ton of people I look, I look up to a bajillion people. Uh, so I've got a lot of favorites. I like a lot of people. But if we're talking favorite strength athletes, um, I don't know, off the top of my head, Jeff Carone, uh, Dan Green, Big Z. Those are my favorite three, but I can literally rattle on forever because I love Andre Milanachev. I love Trey. Like, there's a crazy, crazy long list of people that I think are really cool because that's cause why I got into this. I saw someone that was like wicked strong. I'm like, God damn, that guy's cool as fuck. I want to be like that. I want to get wicked strong. I want to death of a thousand. That sounds so fucking cool. I want to be like that guy. So it's like, this is where a lot of my, my I, like my ideas come from these people because uh, I think they're smart. But uh, non-strength athletes, I'm from Seattle. Marshawn Lynch is probably my favorite non-strength athlete, although some people kind of categorize American football as like pseudo strength sport adjacent. Uh, and then combat sports, again, that's a crazy long lift. Uh, list. I was a big Pacquiao fan. I was a big Triple G fan when I was boxing. And there's a billion MMA fighters that I really like. I love Rob Whitaker a lot. So that, I'll, I'll limit it there. But goddamn, yeah, I got a lot of people that I like and I look up to. All right, Kirsten has just returned from work. So I'll try to wrap this up uh, so I don't leave her hanging around doing nothing. Uh, apparently she won some Lucky Charms at like a thing at work, a scavenger hunt at work for like St. Patrick's Day. So we got some Lucky Charms in the house. That's fun. That's my favorite cereal. That's not a question, but it's my favorite cereal. Uh, let's see. What's been your proudest achievement in both sports and outside? 600 bench. Answer. That's the answer to both. I haven't done anything outside of lifting. Uh, I am not a productive member of society. Next one. Uh, haven't seen you answer this, but maybe you already have. What does your week look like training-wise? Uh, you, do you go three, four, five days a week? Uh, what are you doing on days that aren't dedicated to training to stay on track? So uh, I tried to do a seven-day microcycle because I've done an asynchronous like microcycle where it was like eight, nine days long. Uh, it was just inconvenient for scheduling with Kirsten, who works on obviously a seven-day work week where things are standardized. It was very helpful to keep lined up with a seven-day week so that way we can keep coordinated for grocery trips and you know errands and all that stuff. Um, so I do a seven-day microcycle. I lift weights um, five of those days. I do some form of exercise all seven days. So day one, Monday, uh, is an overhead day um, where I do like overhead work, chin-ups, and then lots of like auxiliary pressing variations and isolations um, and a little bit of hit cardio. Day two is my primary squat day, secondary deadlift day, and then I do like deadlift assistance and abs, and then I do a little bit of hit cardio. Uh, day three is my event day where I do grip uh, dynamics so moving events uh, and I do loading events and then a little bit of hit cardio uh, day four is an hour of steady state there's also 20 minutes of steady state on all these other days but uh, hour of dedicated steady state trying to work at the upper end of zone two so about working about as hard as I can while still breathing through my nose um, that's my goal there uh, day five, I have not been counting very well. Uh, day five is primary deadlift, secondary squat, deadlift assistance and abs, a little bit of hit. Uh, day six is my other overhead day with a bunch of other like auxiliary pressing work and isolations uh, and a lot of like upper back work, meaning like face pull, pulls, rear delt flies, that kind of stuff. Day seven, another hour of dedicated zone two work. Um, what am I doing? I'm, every day I'm doing mobility. Every day I'm doing like a little mental imagery work. Every day I'm obviously following my nutrition, my hydration. Um, and sometimes I'll do like skill sessions out in my garage where I'm not allowed to use more than the empty bar, but I'll work on the patterns that I'm going to use the next day. Next one. Is Lucas Hatton your big brother? <laughs> no. Although now that he's shaved his head, 
all meatheads gradually converge towards looking like the same person because we all grow the beard out to hide the fact that we're fat and then we all lose our hair. So we're all converging towards being the same person. Uh, but I did used to train at the same uh, gym as Lucas. By the way, Lucas, if you make it into this, uh, congratulations on third place at the Arnold UK. Uh, good work. Very good work. Uh, God damn, stop leaving me so far in the dust. It's hurting my feelings a little bit. But congratulations. Um, Gotta get into, gotta, gotta wait for it to fail my face ID twice. All right, got any more? Are planks enough for ab hypertrophy? If, you're goal, trying, if your goal outcome is hypertrophy the abs, just doing planks will probably leave a little bit on the tank. We suspect that range of motion is probably an important variable to hypertrophy. Abs are no different. We should probably be training with them with something that takes them through a bit of a strength shortening cycle against resistance, taking them to a reasonable proximity to failure, just like any other muscle. Uh, if we just did nothing but isometric holds for our bicep, our bicep would absolutely hypertrophy, but we'd probably be leaving some gains on the table. The abs are probably no different. I would definitely throw in at least some like hanging leg raises uh, if your goal is like more hypertrophy oriented. If we're talking more like core strength, we still probably want something where we're moving, but they, they, they go a long way for midsection strength if we just start doing weighted planks. Um, how do you decide when do you give someone a set weight with open-ended reps versus a set amount of reps uh, with an RPE cap for weight. Kind of depends on if I trust the athlete to realistically select their weight or if I know they're going to chronically under or overshoot. I might select their weight for them so they follow a smooth progression. The number of reps per set is something that may, they might suss out. Like I say, might, I might say rep till RPE 7-ish. It's very hard to actually appraise during the set, but we come in with an expectation based on what we've done in the past. We, rough, we rep to roughly that, and then we check in and kind of adjust for the next set. So it's not too much like intra inter intraset thinking going on there. Um, but if it's someone that I don't expect to accurately pace out their training block very well, if I leave the loads up to them, like a chronic over or under shooter, I'll kind of favor them following a fixed track of progression for weight on the bar. The amount of reps they do is what's variable. But if I have a very advanced athlete that has a very good feel of how strong they need to be at a given time, what they need to be, what they need to touch for the next session, and they're, they're very in tune with their body, um, then I might leave the reps and the sets are fixed and then the weight is up to them. So it Kind of depends a lot on the psychology of the athlete which one i think might be more appropriate all right i gotta wrap this up there's a bunch of really good questions that i want like i can rattle on about lifting all day i think it's all i think about i really like it um there's one about um christian thibodeau's program beast building specifically the first phase the motor skill acquisition protocol um, and how that is something that martins lisi's has historically used on like a lot of his overhead events to prepare for a show and my thoughts on it which is actually really crazy coincidence because i was just talking uh to logan a strongman at my gym about that protocol and how useful it is for scaling to like overhead with leg drive training as opposed to like building your volume via sets of eight which is very not necessarily the best way to do it uh, doing this time interval where we're trying to get in a certain amount of work above a certain percent. I'm already going into it. I might make a video about that at some point um, and how that works quite well. Uh, but there's a bunch of good questions here. I really appreciate you guys putting the thought into asking good questions. It makes these a lot more interesting. But I got to wrap it up because this is I could go on forever and there's a lot more of these. Thank you guys. Uh, if you liked it, like the video. Appreciate you as always. If you got ideas for videos, throw them in the comments. I've been reading the comments. Um, I probably will stop as soon as I see something mean that hurts my feelings. But uh, thank you guys for watching. Appreciate you.